My name is Mike Dickerson. I'm going to be talking about a side project of my PhD research, which was into the evolution of flightless birds. And uh, the title, of course, is The Pedomorphic Flightlessness and Taxonomic Affinities of an Enormous Recent Bird, uh, or in English, What, if anything, is Big Bird? So what does research into flightless birds, the evolution of flightless birds, actually entail? It entails a lot of time working in museum collections, where I did most of my research. This is me in the extremely unair conditioned uh, wing of the Vienna Museum of Natural History one summer. It's an ostrich bone I'm holding this cassowary and emu nearby as well. So I measured a lot of bones um, and tried to reconstruct the size changes and life history of various flightless birds. And the next stage was to visit the bowels of extremely poorly lit museums all over Europe. This is the Museum of Natural History in Paris, a Victorian cabinetry stacked to the roof. Those are mammoth bones in the middle foreground, and in the left foreground is the tibiotarsus from the largest bird that ever lived, the elephant bird of Madagascar. So after digging around in bones in museums, uh, if we found anything that looked like a new species, I would help with the description. So these are drawings of a flightless crane from Bermuda that I was doing with a collaborator at the Smithsonian. So we got very used to looking for potential new species, and then I discovered there was, in fact, a new species, an extent, a living species of flightless bird uh, that had yet to be described and undertook this as a scientific project. It was a worthy project because the bird was still alive. It was one of the largest known birds and it had some unique anatomical features that I found extremely important and useful and worthy of some scientific description. So that's what I undertook. So the first thing you have to do is to establish a type locality. <laughs> Where is the specimen actually from? And Unusually enough for flightless birds, this species is found in a restricted area of an urban setting in North America. Um, we actually know the exact type locality, which is unusual for, for some collections. So once we've established that, we came up with a name for it. So I established a new genus and species, Grande Crocarbus via sesamensis, large yellow bird. The specific name there you can see is just the Latinized version of the type locality. All right. So it's been given in a formal scientific name now, which is wonderful. Um, what's the next thing we have to do is establish how does it differ <laughs> from other birds? That's my, that's my reconstruction of the skeleton there. I, we have not actually got a specimen. Uh, so apart from the elongate neck and the unusual hindgut fermentation, uh, it's got two strange features. It's got a modified three-fingered wing, which is unusual for birds, of course. And the foot, the, toe, the foot bones have been shrunk. Now, modified wings are not completely unknown in birds. This is a South American flightless bird in which the flightless wing is speculated to have been a clawed hunting implement. So we know it's happened before, but the, this particular bird, it is quite extreme. The other feature that's notable is the degree of reduction in the foot bones. Now, most people think that birds you know, have you know, kind of knees bend backwards. In fact, the feet on birds are fused bones. Birds walk on their toes. So you can see that a chicken foot is relatively long, a penguin foot is extremely short, but in Grande Crocavis, the, the tarsus is so short that it almost walks on the tarsus, which is very unusual <laughs> in a bird. What sort of bird is it? Well, not what you would think. It is not actually a member of the group of giant flightless birds that exist today, the emus, ostriches, cassowaries. Uh, for one thing, of course, they have very long tarsus. They have no trace of wings, not a heavily modified three-fingered wing. And notice their beaks are extremely short, unlike Grundy Crocavis. So I do not think I think it's actually a rat-eyed bird. Now, the, <laughs> the first description... Please, this is science, OK? This is, I'm trying to do science here. It's very hard. Um, the first description of Grandi Crocavis described it as an eight-and-a-half-foot tall canary, which is just... Which is not really plausible, is the songbirds almost never go flightless, and when they do, they scarcely increase in size. So, my speculation, my hypothesis is that Grand Crocavus is actually a giant flightless crane. There are two known flightless cranes in the fossil record, one from Bermuda, one from Cuba. I've studied the bones of both in the Smithsonian and the Berlin Museum. What does it mean to study a flightless crane? Well, I pulled open a random drawer in the Berlin Museum of Natural History and found the entire world collection of the Cuban crane. The only reason it was there is because the museums in former East Berlin, who had a friendly relationship, as you can imagine, with Cuba at one point. So the scientists were allowed to go and collect there, and they've since been denied. So that's all we know about it. But notice the beak. Notice how similar it is to Grande Crocavis. Now, there are a couple of extant cranes that could be ancestors of these. Uh, the two flightless cranes from islands are probably descended from the sandhill crane, which is still a common crane in North America, relatively small bird, 
But there is another species of much larger crane that's a much more plausible ancestor for Grandicrocarvus, and it is the hooping crane, which is endangered now, but notice something interesting, and in that the juvenile plumage of the hooping crane has a gold and the orange fluffy character, which is extremely similar to the adult plumage of Grandicrocarvus. This is a $2 word called pedomorphosis. Tell it to a scientist one day, they'll be very impressed. So that's what I postulate as the ancestor of Grandicrocarvus. Here's the problem. The two, the two, you'll notice the difficulty is that these cranes have evolved on, two of them have evolved on islands, as you would expect, since flightless birds tend to evolve on islands, exhibit A where we're sitting. But what's a flightless crane doing in New York? That seems an unusual position, but no, because as you'll see, the type locality is in fact on an island. So if we cast our imaginations back, Imagine millions of years ago when flocks of flightless cranes roamed the wilds of Long Island before humans arrived and banished them to the, the recesses of an urban situation where they hang on today. What do we need? We need more evidence. We have no specimens. This is a moa footprint. We need footprints. We need feathers. Most importantly, we need a blood sample from which we could then extract DNA which would solve the problem of what this bird's closest relative is. So that's my plea to you, is if you ever see one, try and get some blood off it. I'd like to thank my long-suffering PhD advisor who, and graduate students have heard several different versions of this talk over the years. This is the first time I've presented these results in the Southern Hemisphere, by the way, so I feel privileged. Uh, but of course, none of this research would have been possible without the efforts of one man who I'd like to specially to thank tonight.